Well, hello, everyone. Um, so I gave, gave talk to you uh, or talks to you about multiple sclerosis and it was loads of me talking and not many cases and people didn't like it and everyone was tired and bored because it's impossible to give a MS talk in 45 minutes these days. So I was asked to switch the, the format and I really like it actually, the new format. So kudos to you. Um, so we're going to go strictly through a uh, case-based presentation. It's, we're going to have five cases and I try to kind of, um, we're already chatting. Okay. Um, so I'll, I try to kind of make a illustrative cases. So some of them you might kind of think to yourself, oh, is this even possible? And some of them are kind of conglomerates of patients that I've seen through the year. Um, they are different. So we can do brief questions if you have questions after each case, if or we can just do questions at the end, whatever you prefer, but the cases are quite different. Um, so we're gonna go through diagnostic process. We're gonna look at cases that um, try to explain current diagnostic criteria for multiple sclerosis. We're gonna look at some therapeutic strategies or how do we treat patients with multiple sclerosis. And then there is one case that is um, about symptoms associated with multiple sclerosis. Here we go. Okay, so we'll start with the case number one. So we have a 33-year-old man who has no significant past medical history, but he noticed um, right-sided facial numbness that has been worsening or started two, three days ago, and that got worse over two, three days. Um, he noticed that he has a little bit of slurring of a speech, and his friends also, or friend also commented that his speech sounds a little bit slurred. So the symptoms were not getting better. So he called his primary care physician and was told to go to the emergency room because um, there was a concern for stroke. Uh, when he presented to emergency room, his vital signs were stable. He was afebrile. He has completely normal systemic um, exam that was not revealing any pathology. He had no rash, no fevers, no infections, nothing like that, or no signs of infection, we should say. His mental status was intact. Um, his cranial nerves exam showed that he has decreased light touch and temperature in the distribution of the cranial nerve, nerve five on the right in all three branches. And he does have a little bit of dysartria, um, not because of he has facial asymmetry, his facial his face is completely symmetric, but he does have a little bit of slurred speech. His motor exam is intact, and he also has a decreased light touch and pinprick on the right side, on the right-sided extremities, including trunk. His reflexes were symmetric. His toes were down going. His coordination was fine. His gait was normal, including heels and toes and tandem. So we asked patients as neurologists to, ask, uh, to walk on their heels and toes and the tandem walk that looks a little bit like a sobriety test when you get pulled over by um, traffic police. His CAT scan of the brain is negative for any few changes. So he gets a MRI of the brain. And this is what MRI of the brain shows us. We have the axial flare scans on the top. You see what we would call T2 or flare hyperintense lesions in particular locations. We also have a sagittal scan and he received a contrast and you see that there is some enhancement um, with a contrast. So patient um, got a neurology consult and was told that he is safe to be discharged home, but he was um, it was stressed to him that he needs to make an appointment with a neurologist, which he did. And he went to see a local community neurologist. So his further workup then included cervical spine MRI, which was normal. Um, his blood work showed weakly positive Lyme antibody and his Lyme Western blood was negative. He had a spinal tap and his CSF had normal protein and glucose. He had three white blood cells, one red blood cell. Red blood cell. He had no oligoclonal bands and he had normal IgG index. His line PCR was negative in the CSF. So further um, questioning, patient reported that he does go frequently walk in a forest area. He maybe had few tick bites, maybe one over the past few months. And so the diagnosis of CNS line was made for the patient. Um, he got three months of antibiotics, IV, 
and eventually the speech on and right side numbness on the face and extremities have resolved. He continued his follow-up with a community neurologist and did get two annual MRI, but because they were stable over the next two years, he was discharged from care as a um, treated CNS line. Five years later, he started to have um, right, leg, right leg numbness that um, lasted about two weeks, but he thought it was either from exertion or sciatica or he slept wrong. His symptoms did not resolve completely, but it did not really limit his functionality, so he never went and sought any medical attention. Another five years went by, and he started to have increasing difficulty with sports, as in his motor performance. He started to have more troubles with activities that require higher ex exertion, uh, such as long walks. He had to stop play tennis and started to complain that his right foot was catching while he was walking for a longer time. Nothing was getting better and in fact, symptoms were getting worse. So he returned to see a neurologist. Um, now his repeat line test was negative. He had a repeat um, spinal tap and now he, his spinal tap showed positive oligoclonal bands and elevated IgG index. When he had a repeat MRI brain, he had increased lesion burden and he also had significant disease in a cervical spine. So this, or his, is his MRI after 12 years, um, or 10 years rather. So you see multiple <clears throat> lesion in the cervical spine, shady gray area. And you also see a multiple ovoid paraventricular juxtacortical lesions in the brain with increased load um, of lesions that would be saw initially. Okay, so eventually patient did get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and came to my clinic. And if you think it's not possible, it is because um, CNS line tends to be a very common misdiagnosis or what patients insist they have or they're told they have because of this you know, elusive um, concept of chronic Lyme or CNS Lyme without any prior um, Lyme, uh, um, presentation of Lyme, like a arthritis or a rash arthritis and other presentations that you would expect to have before someone does develop CNS Lyme. So how do we, this case, um, is trying to illustrate how do we approach diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis is still, despite having MRIs and all other advances, is still a clinical diagnosis. It means that we have to first establish a probability that the events or attacks or whatever history patient is reporting is really consistent what we would expect to be um, a demyelinating attack, right? Relapsing remitting disease is the most common um, disease, uh, common form of multiple sclerosis. So we look in history for periods of, of neurological disability or a history of attacks that patients are reporting that have the expected dynamics. So there is a sort of semi-gradual or semi-acute onset, then buildup of the severity, then plateau of the symptoms, and then improvement. And if you hear that, over and over again in someone's history, then your um, concern should be that patients are um, describing a demyelinating attacks, just like the patient did when he had two or three days of numbness um, of his face and also um, extremities. And after some time, those symptoms go away, then there's a period of remission, then patients start to have numbness in the leg that goes away, maybe not completely. So, so Clinical presentation like that should um, raise a suspicion in an appropriate population that demyelinating disease might be happening. The diagnostic criteria that heavily re now rely or, or are supported heavily by, M by MRI should be, on uh, should be applied to patients only when you suspect those demyelinating disease, uh, uh, those demyelinating events. So, the most common reason of misdiagnosis or overdiagnosis of multiple sclerosis is when patients get MRIs and they are found to have 
non-specific white matter changes and um, they're sort of forced into looking for any sort of vague neurological presentation or neurological symptom because radiologists really like to put demyelinating disease as a reason for any white matter lesions that you might see on MRI. So that's usually where, where the misdiagnosis happens. There's always a caveat of no better explanation. And we like to use um, these two requirements, dissemination in space and time, that we have to, or patients have to fulfill in order for us to diagnose somebody with clinically definite multiple sclerosis or if you wish, most commonly relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Primary progressive MS has a separate diagnostic criteria and they are a little bit more stringent than the relapsing remitting disease. So the diagnostic criteria evolve over the time. And as I said, the availability and advancement of, uh, of MRI kind of pushed that diagnosis or the speed sped up the process of diagnosis. So we're able to diagnose patients much, much faster. So how does one fulfill the dissemination in time and space. As we said, um, multiple sclerosis remains a clinical diagnosis and you can diagnose patients uh, with typical presentation, typical history and finding on exam without ever getting MRI. So if you find yourself practicing somewhere where you cannot get MRI right away, whatever, wherever that is, if you have a patient of the, as I said, appropriate age with neurological symptoms, that meet this criteria, you can diagnose them. And what is it in a clinical practice is that you will acquire, let's say, a female patient in her mid-20s who comes to a clinic and will tell you that she has a very blurry vision in her right eye and it hurts her to look from right to left and a right red color kind of looks like orange when she looks. Um, she might have a little bit of periorbital pain, but mostly the pain is when she moves the eye from right to left. And if you check her visual acuity and her visual acuity is let's say 2050 in the right eye and 2020 in the left eye, you might start and you do your rest of your exam and maybe you find an APD. Um, you might start to form a suspicion in your head that this is a attack of optic neuritis. And then you ask this young woman whether anything ever happened to her. And she said, yes, about three years ago, my feet went numb and that numbness went up to my knees. It wasn't really bad. It lasted about 10 days and then everything went away. So I really never went anywhere. And you do your exam and you find that she has slight decreased vibratory sensation. And there's no other reason why she would have a decreased vibratory sensation because she's not diabetic. In fact, she's a healthy young woman then you are now meeting diagnostic criteria because you had two attacks that are disseminated in time because there have been two years in between. And there's also dissemination in space because one of the areas was optic nerve. And if she had a weak, if she had numbness in her feet, you'd probably think spinal cord, right? And then if you exclude anything else which could explain it, maybe you test her for NMO or other antibodies and if everything tests negative, then you can arrive at diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Obviously, you will get your imaging because we do, or you will send patient to a neurologist who will get the imaging. But what happens is that young woman comes with optic neuritis and she swears up and down that nothing, nothing ever happened to her. There was no other neurological attack or event, nothing. This is her first um, attack that happened to her. So then we can still, we are still required to meet dissemination in space and time to meet a criteria for what we call clinically definite multiple sclerosis. But because our young woman had one event in a time, we need to pull in some other um, helpers, substitutes for that clinical presentation. So if we need to meet dissemination in space, we can use our newest um, MRI criteria. And if we get MRI of the brain and the spinal cord, and we find one lesion or one and more lesions in um, two or more of those critical locations, then we are meeting dissemination in space. And the critical um, location for multiple sclerosis are 
paraventricular, cortical or juxtacortical, posterior fossa or spinal cord. So if we get an MRI on that young woman and we find two periventricular lesion and one spinal cord lesion and one uh, cerebellar lesion, then we'll be meeting dissemination in space, which is good. Now we only need to meet dissemination in time. So there are a few ways how to meet it. We would do a gadolinium enhanced scan. And if we find that those two periventricular lesions enhance, we can use that as a dissemination in time. If we decide to do a second MRI week later, which no one does, but for the illustration for academic purposes, we say, okay, she has no enhancement on the first scan, so a week later, we're gonna get a second scan, and we find a new lesion, she meets dissemination in time. And if none of that happens, we decide to perform a spinal tap and we find oligoclonal bands in her CSF, we can also use that as a substitute to dissemination in time. So now you see how women with one attack and MRI changes can already be diagnosed with relapse and remitting disease. And a point as we see later is to diagnose patients early and treat them early. So have we applied our diagnostic criteria correctly to this young man when he had his first attack with a numbness, we would find that our young man has lesions where he needs to have them. He has paraventricular lesion. He has a juxtacortical lesion. One of the lesions enhances. Um, the oligoclonal bands can be negative very early on in multiple sclerosis. And oligoclonal bands do not make or break, sort of do not make or break diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. They are helpful in different instances, but they are not carrying the main weight of the diagnosis. The main weight really is on clinical presentation and MRI imaging that agrees what, would you, what you would expect in a clinical presentation. Um, so the most common um, caveats for no better uh, explanation are listed here. So B12 deficiency can very commonly use sensory presentation, very similar to those in transverse myelitis. Infectious um, diseases obviously um, have to be excluded. Lyme um, is one of them. And while I have not diagnosed patients with neuro Lyme in my career, I have diagnosed a few patients with multiple sclerosis that initially were diagnosed as, as neuro Lyme or CNS Lyme. Vascular AVM, vasculitis catacil AVM, um, very commonly for a spinal cord lesion in the patients who might not have any other lesions than a CNS, but they would have a spinal cord lesions. You always wanna think about AVM. Spinal cord tumors, mucor dystrophies, other inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. Here, caveat for lupus and Sjogren's. Um, patients with multiple sclerosis sometimes can have low positive antibodies for ANA and Sjogren's antibodies, but have no other systemic rheumatological presentation. So then it should be also, uh, one should be very careful to diagnose those patients with rheumato rheumatological diseases just on, based on presence of antibodies. Um, cervical spondylosis, um, also in older patients, um, possible reason for lesions in spinal cord. So what happened to, to our patient as we followed him through that 12 years from his diagnosis is that he started as relapsing remitting disease. So he had his first attack based on which he was sort of misdiagnosed and second attack came and maybe he had few more attacks. But if you listened, um, at some point, he started to develop what we call a progression of the disease when there was no defined attack, but his left leg, his right leg started to catch. He has to stop playing tennis. He has to slow down his walking. He cannot tolerate um, activity with higher exertion. So this is when patients start to progress in a progressive phase. So his case is relapsing remitting disease when that progression into secondary progressive disease. Ready for case two? Yep, all right. Okay, so here we have a 54-year-old man who noticed that he has a right foot drop. 
he noticed it when he was again playing sports or running. He almost fell a few times, went to a, his PCP and then was told go to an orthopedist because you probably have a pinched nerve. So he has no back pain, no sensory symptoms in that right leg or foot. Um, there's no pain that progresses in sort of a um, radicular distribution. Sometimes the strength would get better with rest or better with rest. He gets an MRI of the lower back. He has some facet joint spondyloarthritis. There's some disc, disc bulges, um, but there's no really frank herniation. Nevertheless, he gets a laminectomy at the L4, L5. And he does not really do as well as he thought he would. The symptoms do not get better. And in fact, in few next few years, um, they actually get worse. And there's a progression of the weakness in his right leg. There's also increased tightness in both legs. So he goes back to an orthopedist and he's told that there's really nothing else that they can do for him and there's no other surgery that they should perform. So years go by and he continues to have more weakness and tightness in both legs. Intermittently, he gets um, steroid injections in the, for the facet arthropathy or arthritis and he feels somewhat better. Um, he goes to neurologist, he gets an MRI of the brain and he says, and he is told that he has few small strokes, but nothing strokes, but nothing to worry about. His symptoms actually keep continuing to get worse for next 15 years, functionality is declining. He goes back to a neurologist, a different neurologist who gets a cervical spine MRI and sees what he sees and sends patient to MS no, to a MS consult, uh, consultant, which was me. Actually, his um, physician sent him to a neurosurgeon who was smart enough to look at his um, C-spine MRI and say, I don't think this is really a case for me. I think this is a case for a, a neurologist. So I um, saw this patient when he was well into his 70s and still continued to, or still continues to work as a lawyer. And we did diagnose him with primary progressive uh, multiple sclerosis, and we treated him with um, a ocrelizumab, which is the only anti-FDA uh, approved um, medication for a primary care, a primary progressive multiple sclerosis. So there's few red flags that should um, kind of prick your ears up, right? So. Primary progressive MS is usually diagnosed in patients who are older. Your relapsing remitting disease is the disease of the early, late 20s, early 30s, but PPMS is usually a disease of late 40s, early 50s. There's a male to female ratio, almost one to one. And unlike in relapsing remitting disease, it starts very insidiously with something, um, foot drop is very, very common, a, symptom, initial symptom of primary progressive MS. And when you really listen to those patients, they do not really have back pain or nothing out of ordinary. You cannot really see a radicular distribution of the pain. There's no loss of reflexes as you would expect in radicular syndrome. In fact, they are hyperreflexic. They tend to have increased tone in their lower extremities. But if that is not um, examine or, or taken into account, patients will end up with orthopedists or neurosurgeons and will get operated on. The patient actually did have an MRI that when we looked at it back um, on, on his first brain MRI, he already had few paraventricular lesions. Some of them were sort of deep white metal lesion. Um, and because he does have a history of high blood pressure, he was told, oh, these are just small, vessel, uh, small um, strokes as a small vessel disease. So as we said, primary progressive disease does not really have relapses or had, can have an odd relapse. About 20% of patients will experience something as a relapse, but it is a continuously progressing disease. And you see that we have a separate diagnostic criteria for those patients and they are a little bit more stringent. So we separate dissemination in space and in brain and a spinal cord. Obviously, we again start with a clinical presentation. There has to be a progression documented or reported by a patient at least of one year, and that's a progression of neurological disability or neurological findings. 
And you see that we separate, separate now dissemination and space in brain and a spinal cord. And we also use positive oligoclonal bands. And if patient has this documented progression over one year and has at least two out of those three criteria, then you can establish a diagnosis of CPMS. The reason why these criteria are a little bit more stringent is because you're dealing with the population when there can be potential other explanations for what you're finding. Small vessel disease um, and spondyloarthritis with cervical or uh, cervical, usually cervical myelopathy being the most common ones, um, other explanation, right? But you would not expect it, for example, those patients to have multiple lesions, you would not expect them to have uh, positive oligoclonal bands. Okay. So this case um, might be actually something that you guys might encounter in your practices. Um, so we have a 22 year old female who comes to ER after she had a mild concussion. She is a college soccer player. She had a head on head collision with another player. He, she got a CT head that was negative for any acute traumatic changes, but then she still has pretty bad headache and nausea and vomiting. And so the decision is that she should get a MRI of the brain. So she waits for a few hours. The symptoms are slowly improving. She almost goes home, but they say, you know what, just stay and get an MRI of the brain. And she does. And she's told, well, there are no traumatic findings and we can send you home, but you really need to see a neurologist who specializes in multiple sclerosis because we found a few lesions on your brain MRI. Okay. And so this is how her MRI looks like. So we're seeing a few, one juxtacortical lesion, paraventricular lesion. So juxtacortical lesion is the lesion that abuts cortex. There's no U fibers in between, right? Kind of sits on a, on a cortex. You see a nice periventricular lesion. There's a callosal lesion as well. Okay. So we see our young lady and we do a very thorough history. She has no neurological symptoms that was, or never had any neurological symptoms in her history that would last more than 24 hours. So there has not been any vision loss in one or both eyes, no double vision, no loss of strength, no loss of sensation. So she's perfectly healthy. Her bladder and bowel are normal. There's no urgency or frequency. Her balance is great. She has no medical history. There's no family history of multiple sclerosis. She's very healthy. She has had a diet. She's a soccer player. And her exam, as you see, is completely normal. She has normal visual acuity. She walks 25 feet for four and a half seconds, which is a pretty normal walk. Um, so she asks you, so do I have it? What's wrong with me? Do I have a mess? Don't I have a mess? What is it? So we're going back to our statement that multiple sclerosis remains a clinical diagnosis, but there is now a entity that we use or description that we use for the patients that we meet, that we catch in this, what we call early phase. And somebody calls it pre-MS or early MS, but we like to call it radiologically isolated syndrome. It kind of sounds better for patients if you tell someone they have early MS or pre-MS, some of the patients, it might induce a good bit of anxiety. And then when you tell them you're not really going to do much for them in the beginning, except frequent scans, then it's even, um, then they might feel even worse. But so what is radiologically isolated syndrome? It came um, with increased availability of MRI and it was... Um, so that the patients who have radiologically isolated syndrome are just like this patient, where you find incidentally white matter lesions that meet diagnostic criteria for multiple, multiple sclerosis, but those patients never had any clinical presentation that could be labeled as a demyelinating event. So we've been following groups of patients or, or cohorts of patients since 2009, and you see that we started with 44 patients and found out that about 33% converts to clinically isolated syndrome, which is a first demyelinating attack. Um, then was uh, another larger study that looked at 70 patients that would happen in France. And again, the conversion rate stayed about 33%. And then um, we followed enough patients in 2014, we followed them for five years. And again, that um, 
conversion rate remains about 34% for the five years. Um, the, those patients um, in this initial cohort from 2014 were then followed for another five years. Um, and in 2019, their risk increased to be 51%. So as you see with time, the risk that patients will eventually develop a demyelinating event increases. So what are some of the prognostic factors that we look for or that we can guide patients? So if they do have spinal cord lesion, if the patients are younger than 37 when they had their initial scan, um, so these two were strong predictive factor for the first five years. If then with time they have infratentorial lesions and their oligoclonal bands were uh, positive, these were predictive risk factor in the second five years or in a 10 years. So if in the beginning the patient has all four of those um, predicting factors, then their risk at 10 years is up to 87%. So what do we do with those patients? We do not start treatment at the index MRI because we don't know whether they gonna, where are they gonna be in that percentage. Um, but what we do, we do a ongoing radiological and clinical surveillance, a little bit more frequent radiological surveillance in the first year. A good bit of patients just um, start developing more lesions in that first year. So we do it at index three, six, and 12 months. If there's no change during that first year, then we go to yearly scans. If we found new radiological disease activity, which we find um, more often than the clinical activity, that usually at least triggers a discussion with the patient if not um, a starting of the disease-modifying therapy. There are no yet any trial data that would address this situation. There are two trials that I think uh, stopped enrolling last year, um, and we don't have results yet, but they looked exactly at this scenario, whether if you start disease-modifying therapy at the time of the first index MRI, will you decrease risk of conversion or onset of first demyelinating attack or not? Okay, so we talked a little bit about diagnosis and different phenotypes. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about treatment strategies. So we have 27 year old male who has relapsing remitting disease and he comes for a follow up with his MS specialist to discuss care and treatment. Patient was diagnosed with relapsing remitting disease after he had facial numbness for three weeks. He also had a history of right optic neuritis that happened three years before. At the time of optic neuritis, he was, um, seen by a neuro-ophthalmologist, they told him he has an optic neuritis. He told him to follow up with the MS center, but patient did not. His follow-up happened when he got the facial numbness that, um, that led to diagnosis of relapsing and remitting MS. You see his MRI, you see multiple periventricular lesions, some um, radiological activity, so get a linear enhancement. Patient also has a um, pontine lesion that can um, explain his uh, facial numbness. And he also has a um, spinal cord lesion. So we see the lesion in the brainstem and other white matter lesions. So he meets criteria clinically and radiologically. And so we recommend that he start a disease modifying therapy. What is the goal of disease-modifying therapy is to prevent any new clinical or radiological activity. But the discussion is not straightforward. He's interested to hear what you, what you have to tell and what currently available agents we have, but he's also worried about the side effects and safety of the treatment and how is he going to get treatment and his insurance going to co cover it and how high is going to be his copay. Um, he talked to his PCP because his, he has a very good relationship with his PCP, and he was told that usually the safest way is to start on the early, very safe medications and then see whether in time he's going to need something stronger. But he's a young patient, and he joins in an online discussion forum, and the, he hears that many patients very similar to him 
are actually on very new medications or newest medications that they see a commercial in the TV for, and some of them are not daily medications. So it really um, is a nice um, frequency of treatment for them. He likes to travel sometimes for a long time. So he thinks, how am I going to get my treatments if I have to leave United States for two or three months at a time? He also not sure whether he could ever inject himself. He does not really like the needles, but also can he take medication daily? His lab work shows that he is JC virus antibody negative. He has negative hep C and B panels. His quantifying gold is negative, and he did have a chickenpox as a child. So as you see, many factors come into the discussion of the treatment. The discussion of the treatment with multiple sclerosis patients are not sort of here's the medication, go and take it. There's a good bit of factors from both sides that have to come into play. And what we want from our patients is that they sort of buy in into this treatment and are very invested in their treatment because that ensures um, high compliance with the treatment. So all the, all the drugs that we have are what we call anti-inflammatory drugs, means that we do not have any medication that has either neuroprotective or neuroreparative potential. All we can do with our medications is to modify immune system on periphery, mostly on periphery, in a way that prevents those immune cells from causing, uh, causing um, uh, radiological activity which can translate into clinical activity. That inflammatory phase is really mostly robust in early stages in relapsing remitting disease. So the earlier we treat patients, the more real, uh, lesions we can prevent, the more attacks we can prevent and kind of keep their um, CNS reserve where they need to do. And by doing that, we hope, hope to um, prevent a disability progression or disease progression. In multiple sclerosis, disability does not progress from relapses. The really disability progression comes later on when the relapses stop, but patients start um, developing kind of slow progressive loss of function. So again, it's a sort of multifaceted process. We have few other things that we have to consider. In New York State, insurances have a pretty big say of what treatment they're going to authorize and what not. And you really don't want to get into months long wars with insurance agents and having your patients untreated. Obviously, COVID-19 pandemic brought some consideration, especially for immunosuppressive agents, um, vaccinations and other things. So we do not really have one way how we do things and what we use as a first line. We have two strategies that we like to talk about, but I'm not really sure that we kind of subscribe to those strategies. But you will hear something that is called escalation strategy. And that means that you start your patient on what you consider what is largely considered a first line treatment. And then when the patient is not responding or responding incompletely, you escalate the treatment to a higher category or a second line or a third line. So traditionally, um, the interferons and glatiramer acetate or copaxone, so the initial injectable medications were considered the first line treatments. And if patients had few lesions or few relapses, then they were, um, in, then they were advanced to high efficacy treatments. And there we have natalizumab or tisabri, um, S1P inhibitors, so fingolimod, cladribine, ocrelizumab, so higher efficacy medications. So, the, I guess the advantages is that you are starting with a very safe medications, you're sparing patients immunosuppressive effects or you know, safety concerns that some of the high efficacy medications have. But disadvantages is that we really don't know, you know when, um, what is a incomplete response, how many relapses are, are we permissive of, how many new lesions are we permissive, permissive of. And um, if you are gonna wait for relapses to happen or disability to happen, you might find yourself chasing MS and chasing disease with preventative treatment is never a good idea. With a preventative treatment, you really should be ahead of the disease. So what we try to do is we kind of try to use some prognostic factors and, and have a little bit more personalized and targeted treatment for the patients. 
Induction strategy um, is sort of the opposite um, of the escalation strategy, but we, we use that word induction and we borrow it from, I guess, oncology, but we really do not have true inductive treatment. So the induction strategy was a strategy when you started your high efficacy right from the get-go, and then theoretically you would de-escalate the treatment after some time to a lower or safer efficacy medication. But that also does not really happen in a clinical practice if we, because we don't have inductive treatments. When we start high efficacy medications, we continue patients on, on in high efficacy medications. Some of them, if you stop them, um, they can cause a very significant rebound of multiple sclerosis. So stopping them um, abruptly is also dangerous for the patients. So what is the advantages? Obviously, starting very um, efficaciously from the, from the beginning, we like to say that time or brain, time is brain for us uh, as well. So the earlier you start, the more efficacious medication, the better for the patient. But those medications do have safety concerns. They do have um, effect on immunity. They have some side effects um, that has to be um, introduced to patients and kind of discuss with him what that means. So some of the prognostic profile um, that we use are race. So African-Americans and Hispanic usually tend to have more aggressive disease and a worse prognosis. Um, H had onset, older patients tend to do worse because you, can, you, you start to treat them when already disease is ongoing and they are losing their neural reserve. Males tend to do worse, smokers tend to do worse. Obviously any, pre any presence of vascular comorbid or other comorbidities are sort of a double, triple whammy for the central nervous system. So those patients tend to do worse. If the cognition dysfunction is present in the beginning, progressive patients obviously do worse. If your first attack is motor or cerebellar or multifocal, that tends to have a worse progression. If the recovery is incomplete, if the frequency of attacks is high in the beginning, and then a few others, they're pretty self-explanatory. So patients with a poor prognosis, these are the patients that you want them to be on those high efficacy medications from, from the get-go. Okay, so this is how um, our current scenario of medications look like. You see that we started in 1993 with interferon. Now it's 2020, 2021, and we have around 19 um, medications available for MS patients with already few generics. So it's 1.48. I don't know whether I'm running over your allocated time or not. So you tell me um, yes or no. I can take questions or we can go through one more case. Um, I, I think we can uh, do one more case as, as well. Depends on, on how long it takes. We have at least until uh, maybe a little bit before two so we can have uh, okay. questions. All right. So we made it somehow to our last case. So we're going to talk a little bit about other symptoms associated with MS. So we have a 35-year-old female. She has multiple sclerosis and she comes to see her special MS specialist. Um, and it's an earlier follow-up than she originally planned because she has few symptoms that um, are bothering her. Um, they're not new symptoms. She thinks, well, I think my MS is quite well controlled, but I have to, and I take my medication as I'm supposed to. I never miss a dose. But during the past last four months, um, some of the symptoms were, that were not bothersome are now um, becoming a more severe symptom. So what's going on? And she tells you, well, I have to go to the bathroom a lot. And it's very frequently, I get this very strong urge out of nowhere. And then I have to get to the bathroom very quickly. But then I just sit there and I cannot start urination. Then I start and I urinate a little bit. Um, but then in 20, 25 minutes or 30 minutes, I have to go again. This wakes me up four times a night, four or five to times a night, and that really disrupts my sleep. And my super, supervisor at work commented that I have to go to the bathroom a lot and what's going on with that. So my muscles are also tight and I, after I walk a lot and also when I wake up in the morning, I do stretching sometimes once, sometimes twice a day, sometimes not at all, but it doesn't really seem to help. So then I stop because I don't know whether it's helping. There's this burning pain in my feet and they used to only tingle before, but now they really hurt. 
I tend to forget more. I cannot find my words during a conversation. They're on the top of my tongue, but I really cannot say them. And I cannot multitask like I could before. No one told me about it. No one picked up on it at work, but I am really scared that somebody will. I am more fatigued towards the end of the day. I could hardly think straight, but my sleep is also not that great because of my bladder. So she says, okay, what do you think? Is that a new relapse? Am I in one perpetual relapse or is this all caused by my MS or what's going on? Do I need new treatment? What do I do about that? So obviously she's, our patients are young. They are employed, but they're really concerned about their cognitive performance and how that will impact their employment. So all these symptoms that she lists are symptoms that are very commonly associated with MS and they are not really signs of new disease activity. And if the and MRIs, if you get the MRIs on those patients, they tend to be unchanged. They do not show any new lesions. So changing their DMTs really um, does not make much sense if the disease is well controlled, but symptoms can have sort of, and they do very often have sort of separate life a part of the uh, MS control. And even in patients who have very well controlled disease, these symptoms can really destroy their quality of life. So bladder symptoms, pain, muscle spasticity, easy fatigability, sensory symptoms, musculoskeletal problems, earlier onset of arthritis, this all happens in multiple sclerosis patients. Sleep disturbances are really very common as are various cognitive problems. Depression and anxiety with a high suicidality risk um, are very prominent, often um, present in multiple sclerosis. Um, and you have to recognize them and you have to treat them because no matter how well you're going to control the disease itself, you will never sort of have a good relationship with your patient because they will say, yes, I understand, but my life is really not worth living. So we'll start with spasticity very common in multiple sclerosis, more than 80% of patients. It can really happen at any point of the disease and it can happen very early. Obviously with the disease progression, spasticity gets worse. You see that it worsens every aspect of the disease, increases fatigue, causes pain, but also increases the risk of falls. And even in a young patient, spasticity can pose a risk for falls and then lead to depression and anxiety. It's, the spasticity is not just uh, in MS is not like spasticity in a, in a stroke and it tends to fluctuate. So the treatment can be really difficult for those patients. You put them sometimes on medication, too much medication will cause sedation, will decrease the muscle tone and might, and might unmask weakness that we see in multiple sclerosis. So there's no magic pill for any of the symptoms that we will talk about, but daily stretching combination of physiotherapy and massage, acupuncture are usually the more main non-pharmacological treatment that patients will seek. None of those are minimal, number of those are supported by insurance, and it can be very pricey for those patients to really get treatment that they need. Muscle relaxants, Benzodiazepines, botulinum toxin, and cannabinoids are now the main pharmacological agents that we use. Sometimes in combination, we try for monotherapies as much as we can, but the truth is that spasticity is very difficult to control in, in MS. So fatigue, again, very highly prevalent and is actually cited as one of the most debilitating symptoms of MS. However, we do not really know what exactly causes fatigue and multiple sclerosis because many of the other symptoms that we know, uh, where we mentioned will worsen the fatigue. So when you approach the fatigue, you try to first filter out all other symptoms that can make the fatigue worse. So mood disorders, sleep disorders, polypharmacy, polypharmacy obesity, lack of exercise, poor diet that all can work, cause fatigue or worsen fatigue. Obviously, you go through this with patients and they are very unhappy because they say, no, just give me a pill that will treat my fatigue. Um, there is no magic pill. Aerobic exercise was shown to have the largest impact on the fatigue. But if you, we do use medication, we use um, some of those. So modafinil and armodafinil, amantadine. Sometimes we have to resort to very, very low dose of stimulants um, like Adderall, tiny bit of um, dose to allow patients um, 
to function, but you should, again, not look at those as any sort of magic pills. They never had really convincing results in clinical trials, and they really sort of help on case-on-case -case basis. So cognitive impairment starts very early on, and even in patients with radiologically isolated syndrome, when they tested their cognition, their cognitive um, impairment was very similar to patients who had early MS when they compare them with um, healthy control. We do neuropsychological testing for our patients yearly. We start with the first one at the time of diagnosis or when we establish care, and then we retest them every year to follow their cognitive performance. Um, again, many other associated symptoms can have a negative effect on cognition, sleep disorders, mood disorders, lack of exercise, lack of healthy diet. So we try to um, kind of work with patients and improve those. And then there's some form of cognitive rehabilitation and behavioral strategies that we use. Again, um, cognitive rehabilitation is almost never covered by insurances. So it is um, very sad when you have young people who seek employment and cannot get a cognitive rehabilitation. Okay. And then lastly, um, some other um, symptoms that we see in um, multiple sclerosis patients with some of the treatments pharmacological and non-pharmacological that we use. All right, 157. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Klinova. That was great. And thank you for making it case-based. It really helped tie everything together. Uh, now, does anyone have uh, any questions? Feel free to, to let us know or type it in the chat. No one has questions. Everyone's zoomed out or zoomed over. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I, I guess I have a, one question. You mentioned uh, several times the difficulty with insurance in the terms of treatment with MS and, and patients that are uninsured uh, or um, yeah, difficulty obtaining treatment. Is, is there a specific pathway for, that you take? For patients who are uninsured? Yes, uninsured or... So, so for patients who are uninsured and documented, um, the path is, is easier because mm -hmm. every um, company does have um, a free drug program where patients can um, qualify based on their um, income. And uninsured patients usually are patients that qualify for that. Patients who are uninsured and undocumented, now that is a um, little bit more trickier because um, apart from one company, um, as a rule, none of the companies want to provide any benefits for undocumented um, citizens. So that's, uh, there's one, com we're not gonna talk companies, but there's one that allowed me successfully treat patients um, but that's, you know, that's usually a path to public hospitals and uh, kind of relying on this system, which is usually never good for patients with multiple sclerosis. They tend to be, you know, diagnosed late, or late. they tend to have a higher disability. So that's really um, the most difficult position for a patient to be uninsured and undocumented in, in our system, unfortunately. But uninsured patients, um, we see, we see them in a clinic and clinic uh, at Mount Sinai West, I have a Medicaid clinic, has a very good system that they take uninsured patients, run them through the system, help them to apply for basic Medicaid insurance, and that will allow them to be seen in the clinic. Um, and then we can you know, always see them in a clinic and treat them. So uninsured is not a big problem. Um, uninsured undocumented is... Um, uh, we have a question yes. and I'm going to read it. Is there any role of vitamin D supplementation in patients with isolated to prevent progression? So, yes, there's always a role to supplement a vitamin D. Uh, patients uh, or vitamin D has been um, shown to be a risk factor for development on, in, of multiple sclerosis. Now, you can look at patients with RIS as patients who already have multiple sclerosis. It just did not manifest itself clinically. 
supplementation of vitamin D is not going to harm those patients, but whether it truly will prevent progression to clinical or, or evolution into clinical multiple sclerosis, we don't have a data about that. And I would not definitely not promise patients something like that. Again, I would definitely supplement them, but I would not say that I have a data to, you know, to ensure or to assure them that this is enough to prevent onset of a first clinical event. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else have any last minute burning questions? Okay. Uh, I, I think right. have, thank you so much for coming, Dr. Klinova. We really appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Lecture.